Welcome to the first section about System Startup, where I'm going to explain you the role of the run levels and targets in the Linux boot process. In this section, I'm going to present you a few things like what a run level or target is and how to identify the current one and change it, as well as setting the default run level or target the Linux boots into. You'll also learn how to see what services are active in a certain run level or target and enable or disable them from starting at boot. In the end, you will find an exercise to practice what you will have learned in this section. Knowing how to deal with run levels and targets is important for you in order to control the Linux boot process. When booting, Linux enters a default run level or target, which is manually set from either the configuration file in the run levels cases or from the command line for the targets. Each one of them has a set of active services. So what are the run levels and targets? Well, they are actually preset operating states Linux boots into. Each run level or target allows access to a different combination of processes or instances of executing programs. But why do you need to know how to manage targets and run levels? Well, for instance, if you have a Java instance on a server, you want to make sure it starts at boot so, the, so that the application that is hosted on that server has the least downtime possible when rebooting the server or when the server crashes. Also, you don't want to forget about starting it. On the other hand, there are cases when you have more processes that should be started in a specific order with some delay between them, so you want to make sure you're in the control of that. Thus, you have the option to disable them from starting at boot and start them manually later. The demos behind the run levels and targets are init or systemv init that uses run levels and systemd for targets. They are the parent process of all the processes. They are the first one to start and without it, system returns an error that init was not found and kernel panics. One of the difference between init and systemd is that the init starts the process serially and this brings a little delay in processes startup, whereas the systemd starts them all at once. Systemd has been used more by the CentOS and Red Hat distributions. However, the newer versions of Debian and Ubuntu uses it also. So there are seven run levels as such. Run level zero, it's halt and it shuts down the server. Run level one, it's single user and only root can log in. Run level two to five are multi-users and this can be customized and one of these four is the default run level. And the last one, run level six is for reboot. When rebooting a server, it actually enters the run level six. Now regarding targets, they do have pretty much the same purposes like the run levels and each one of the run levels corresponds to a specific target. For instance, run level zero is power off target. Run level one, it's rescue target where only root can log in and it's used for rescues purposes. Run level two, three, four are multi-user target. And run level five, it's graphical target and it has graphical user interface. Whereas the last one, run level six, it corresponds to reboot target. Now, how can you identify the current run level? Well, simply by running the run level command. This command returns the current run level, which in this case is four, and also the previous one if existed. N comes from not known if no run level existed before the current one from boot time. The program responsible for changing the run level is init, and it can be called in two ways, either, either by running the command init or by running the command tell init, and of course the run level we want to switch into, for instance, 3. And now you can see that the current run level is 3, and the previous one was 4. Remember that only root is allowed to alter the run levels or the configuration files. Now regarding the default run level, you need to take a look at the configuration file in etc init tab. And this applies for Debian and CentOS 6 and Red Hat 6. I am now in the configuration file etc init tab and you need to look for the line that says init default. And you can see that it's set on 4. And you can replace this number with anything between 2 and 5. For instance, 3. Save the file. 
and the next time you reboot the server, it's going to boot into run level 3. If you want to list the services that are going to be started or killed on a specific run level, you need to run this command. I'll take, for instance, run level 2. And by running this command, you get a list of all the services that are going to be killed or started when Linux enters run level 2. The numbers that follows S in this case, or in this case, is the priority the service is going to be killed or started with. For instance, the process rcslog is going to be started with priority 1 in run level 2. But what if you want to check if rcslog is going to be started on run level 3 also? You need to run this command. I'm using asterisk here because I don't know what priority our syslog is going to be started with in the third run level. And I get the same thing as in run level 2, that our syslog is going to be started in run level 3 with priority 1. But what if you want to check if our syslog is going to be started or killed on all run levels from the same command? Like the previous one, you only need to replace the 3 with the question mark to display all the run levels. And you get a list of all run levels. And you can see that in run level 0, 1, and 6, the service is going to be killed. Because the server shuts down in run level 0 and reboots in run level 6, all the processes are going to be killed. Whereas in all the other run levels, the service is going to be started with priority 1.
Now for identifying the default target Linux boots into, you can use this command system ctl get default. And you see that it has been set to boot into the multi-user target. Now for changing the default target, you can use this command system ctl set default to graphical target. Make sure you don't set up the default target on power off target or reboot target. Now I have only changed the default target, but for changing the current one, you need to run this command systemctl isolate graphical target. For backing up purposes, they have kept the old commands from Debian also. So for identifying the current target, you can still use the run level command. So you get that the current one is five, which corresponds to graphical target. And the previous one was three, which corresponds to multi-user target. For starting a process in CentOS 7 and Red Hat 7, you're not going to use like in Debian and Ubuntu and CentOS 6, the command in etc init.d. Here we use the systemd with the following command, systemctl start, and I'll take for instance the httpd process. And for checking its status, you can use the following command, systemctl status httpd. And you get that it's active and running, but it's disabled from starting at boot time. Now for enabling it to start at boot time, we are going to use this command, systemctl enable httpd. And now you see that it's still active and running, but it's also enabled a starting at boot time. Now for stopping a process, you can use the following command, systemctl stop httpd. And checking its status again, you see that it's inactive or dead, but it's enabled to start at boot time. So the next time you reboot your server, it's going to start by default. Running out of disk space, it's a significant problem of a Linux system administrator. You might need to deal with lack of space alerts quite often. However, with LVM, things are quite easy and straightforward to be solved. So let's take a closer look at what is LVM. LVM stands for Logical Volume Management, and it's a system of managing the logical volumes and file systems. It's a virtualization layer over the physical drives. It's a simple to use method. You don't need to deal with partitioning and formatting the disks on, or on your own. By running a few simple commands, you can achieve what you want. It allows you to extend the logical volume on the fly while the file system is still mounted and in use. Nevertheless, when reducing the file system and the logical volume, you firstly need to unmount it. It performs online relocation. Data can be moved from one drive to another without affecting the normal functioning of the server. For example, before removing a disk, you need to make sure data is moved to another disk so that you won't lose it. LVM is a very flexible solution in extending or reducing the logical storage volume. The last but not least, data from a logical volume can be striped across multiple disks if needed. It also allows the collection of multiple physical drives and partitions into a single volume group that can be aftermath divided into logical volumes as you need. Okay, now some basic concepts you need to know when using LVM. Physical volumes, they correspond to hard drive disk drives. Logical volumes, they are partitions that hold the file system, but they can be extended across more disks. The volume group is a collection of logical and physical drives. This is the LVM structure. Firstly, there are the hard disks and partitions. Then physical volumes are created, which are afterwards added to the volume group. Volume groups are divided into logical volumes. And over all this, there is the file system. In the following videos, I will show you how to increase and decrease the disk space. But firstly, let's see what the current state of my server is. There is a physical volume of almost 15 gigabytes, which was added to the volume group Debian FG. 
This was aftermath divided into two logical volumes, root and swap, with their corresponding file systems. What I want to do next is to create another volume group out of two hard disks of 5 GB each and add them to a logical volume. In the end, I will mount this volume group on opt partition. Sometimes you need some specific services to run on a different partition than root where the operating system is running, so that's why I will mount the volume group on opt partition. Firstly, I will create a volume group with the first hard disk and then extend it with the second one. The steps necessary to achieve this are as follow. Firstly, I will add the hard disk drive on the virtual machine and create a partition on it, then create the physical volume of the partition previously created, create the volume group, then create the logical volume and the file system, and in the end, I will add an entry in etcfs tab file for mounting at boot time. Now for running a hard disk on VirtualBox, things are a bit different than in VMware, where you could have added a hard disk while the server was still running. Here in VirtualBox, the server has to be shut down firstly. And then go to Settings, Storage, and choose a controller. And I'm going to choose SCSI. And if the controller you wish is not listed here, you can add it from this button and choose the controller you wish to add, and then add a hard disk. Create new disk, VMDK, fixed size, because I want to allocate its size from the beginning. Next, choose its size, and I want it to be one gigabyte, and give it a name. And create. And you can see the hard disk here. I have shown you in the previous video how to add a hard disk drive on the virtual machine. In this video, however, I'm going to teach you how to create a volume group and assign the physical disk to it. But firstly, we need to detect the newly added hard disk drive. And I'm going to do this by running fdisk minus L from listing. And look for the newly added hard disk drive dev sdb of 5 gigabytes. Now I want to create a partition out of this disk and I can accomplish this by running fdisk dev sdb and press m for help. And now this is the menu and I'm going to create a new partition so 
I'm going to press N from new. A primary partition, default one, first sector default, last sector default. Now I want to set its type, so I'm going to press T from type. And you can list all the codes by running L. And now I want this partition to be Linux LVM. So Linux LVM has the code 8E. I have changed the type of the partition to Linux LVM. Write the partition table and quit. Now that I have the partition, I want to create a physical volume. And I can accomplish this by running pv create dev sdb1, the partition. And physical volume dev sdb1 was successfully created. Now that we have the physical volume, we can create the volume group. fg create. FG opt. I want to name it FG opt because, as I mentioned in the previous video, I want to mount this file system to the opt partition. So I gave it a specific name, FG opt, out of dev sdb1. So volume group was successfully created. Now, in order to create the logical volume, there are several ways, and I'm going to present you a few of them. One of them is by specifying the size of the logical volume, like this, 5 gigabytes. Another way, another way is to specify the percentage of the space from the volume group to be occupied with this logical volume, like this. For instance, 60% of the volume group. Another way is to occupy the whole 100% space of the volume group, and this can be accomplished like this and also specify the volume group name. And another way of creating the logical volume is to specify the number of the total physical extents of the volume group. And in order to find out the total number of the physical extents, you can run this command fg display and look for the newly created volume group fg opt. And here is the total physical extents, 1,279 physical extents. And one physical extents has 4 megabytes. And if you multiply 4 megabytes with 1,279 physical extents, you are going to get the volume group size. So I'm going now to create the logical volume by specifying the total number of the physical extents. Since I want the, volume, the logical volume to occupy the whole space of the volume group. LV create 1279 9 FG opt and I'm going to name it LV opt. Now that we have the logical volume, you need to, to set up the file system MKSF. So it's done. Now we need to mount the file system to the opt partition, and you can accomplish this by running mount dev fg opt lv opt to opt partition. And check it was mounted. And you can see now that 5 gigabytes, 4.8 gigabytes were allocated to the opt partition. But this was a temporary mount until you reboot the server. If you reboot the server, it is not going to mount automatically. So in order to make this a permanent mount, you need to add an entry to the file etc fs tab. And add this entry. Specify the volume group and the logical volume on the mount point, opt partition, the type of the file system is ext4 and the options and I'm going to leave them by default. Save the file. So the next time you reboot the server, the file system is going to be mounted automatically on the opt partition.
Another task of a Linux system administrator is to set up the network and troubleshoot issues when they appear. The virtual machine you have set up on VirtualBox or on VMware has a dynamically assigned IP. However, it's very useful to get to know how to set up the network manually by assigning it a static IP. Uh, for a Linux server, it's also very important to have a static IP that doesn't change when communicating with other servers. Since one of the reasons um, is the security, many of the servers use firewall and they don't allow access from anywhere, but only from certain addresses. So if your IP changes often, the server won't be able to access other servers. Before going to do some hands-on work on how to set up the IP statically, there are some other network configuration files to look at.
SSH or Secure Shell, it's a popular remote login tool that encrypts both the password and data transferred between the servers. Uh, the most popular SSH server that implemented SSH protocol is OpenSSH and it's usually by default installed on the server. There are other remote login protocols like Telnet and Virtual Network Computing or VNC. Unfortunately, they exchange everything unencrypted, even the passwords. So anyone who wants to monitor your network traffic can get those sensitive data. Now the configuration file for OpenSSH is in etc SSH, sshd config. But it usually works very well and you don't need to make any changes on this file. It contains a number of options and most of them are commented. And what is left out uncommented is usually enough to work well. However, there are a couple of options you might need to know uh, if you want to increase the security of your server. One of them is password authentication. which is set on yes. And it's an option that specify if authentication using passwords is supported. Another option would be public key, pub key authentication, which comes from public key authentication and, it, and it's set on yes. And it's an option that allows you to connect to the server using a public key instead of a password. Another option for security reasons, um, it's a very important option and it's permit root login. And can take arguments like yes without password, forced commands only and no. In the previous versions it used to come with a yes as a default value, now it's without password in order to increase the security of the server. And it's an option that um, it, if it's set on yes, allows anyone to log in using the root account. By setting this option to no or to without password, it will make anyone log in as a local user firstly and then acquire root privileges. This might prevent someone who has got the root password to log in into the server unless they have a local user firstly or if they only have public keys. Now to log in on a server using the password authentication is quite simple. And it's SSH root and the IP or the name of the server. But this won't work because um, on the other server I'm trying to connect connect right now, they have the permit root login set on without password, so it, it doesn't work. So I'm going to try with a local user. Now it worked. And control D to disconnect to close the connection. Another way to log in into a server through SSH is using encryption keys. Uh, there is a pair of keys, one public and one private, and they are related in a way that data encrypted with a public key can only be decrypted with the pairing private key. Uh, this method improves the security of the server since the risk of um, cracking the password is eliminated. Encryption keys are almost impossible to decipher and additionally, you can set a passphrase on the private key also. So let's get to generating the keys. Firstly, um, I'm now on the client machine, the machine I'm going to initiate the connection from and I need to run ssh keygen minus t rsa. And now I need to answer a couple of questions like the file in which to save the key and I'm going to press enter because the default value is already suggested within the brackets. Enter a passphrase. Now this is optionally. As I said, having a passphrase set to protect the private key is good 
since someone who steal your private key cannot initiate connections without entering the pass passphrase too. However, it has a downside that you need to type it all the time as if having a password. So for security reasons, I'm going to set up a passphrase too. And again, and now the key was generated. Now the next step is to copy the public key to the virtual server you need to connect to. And uh, you can accomplish this by running ssh copy ssh copy and use tab for autocomplete ssh copy id and the user I want to connect on the other server with and the IP. 12.133 and now the, the public key was copied on the other server. Now we can go ahead and um, log in into the destination server without entering the password. However, since I had set up a passphrase, I will need to type that every time I connect. Now I'm I'm going to try to connect SSH Carmen 192 168 12 133 and now I need to enter the passphrase. If I hadn't set up a passphrase, I wouldn't have um, typed anything now. I would have been logged in directly. Another thing I wanted to share with you, it's actually this folder ssh within the home user and contain it contains the private key and the public one which was copied in the server the destination server in authorized authorized keys file but most important i wanted to show you this file known hosts which actually contains the fingerprints for all the servers you connect to until this moment. So you notice maybe in the previous time that when I tried to connect on the destination server, for instance, this one, I was prompted with this question that if I am sure to continue connecting since the authenticity of the host cannot be established. And they also specify the fingerprint. So if I now press yes and I connect to that server, the next time I, I'm going to connect to it, I'm not going to get this question anymore because the fingerprint, this fingerprint, it will be copied to the known hosts file. Now there is a scenario when you might want to remove the fingerprint of a server from a file. And that is when you um, had a server with a certain IP and you assign that IP to another server. So you try to connect on, on that IP now and they don't allow you. For instance, I am going now to connect on this IP and it is not possible because the remote host identification has changed. So they suggest me to either remove the known host file at all or to only remove the fingerprint for this IP. And if I run this command, ssh keygen minus f from home carmen ssh known hosts minus r remove 192.168.12.135. And now I can successfully log in on 135 server. Yes. Enter passphrase. And I'm on that destination server. And I can also take a look in the SSH folder on that server to see how the authorized keys looks like. And this is actually the public key from the client server. I connected from.
One of the tasks of a Linux system administrator is to set up firewalls and rules. Firewalls should be configured in such a way that you allow incoming and outcoming network traffic, but you also secure your server well enough so it won't be vulnerable to attacks. One of the ways to secure the server is actually to use IP tables. IP tables is usually installed by default on many distributions and it's used to deal with packet filtering. Uh, IP tables has three types of um, tables, filter, NAT and mangle. And in this video, I'm going to deal more with the filter table, which is also the default table for IP tables. Each table has a couple of chains that contain rules. So for instance, the filter table, which is displayed here, has the chain input, which filters packets coming to the server, and then the chain forward, that filters the packets that are routed through the local server and have the destination set on another network interface card on the same server, and the last one, the output chain, for packets generated by the server. Now, if you want to check the existing rules, you can run iptables-l or nvl, which is numeric verbose, and the difference between the two of them, for instance, is that the second one displays, displays the chain packet counter, the number of packets and bytes that match the rules within that chain. Now, by default, this command only displays the filter table, which is the default one. But if you want to display another one, you can use the option T and the name of the table, for instance, NAT. And you can see the chains and the rules within the NAT table, for instance, chain pre-routing, chain input, output, and post-routing. Now, let, let's add some rules. IP tables minus A. And specify a append, specify the chain input minus s, the source 192, 168, 133, jump to the target drop. So I want all the packets coming from 192, 168, 12, 133 to be dropped. And now list the rules and target drop all protocols source jesse and um, i have this ip as an entry in etc hosts that's why the source appears as jesse here and destination anywhere so all the packets coming to all the ports on all protocols from this ip are going to be dropped now another way to block an ip it's actually to reject the packets instead of dropping them minus j reject and the difference between uh, the two of them is that when you use the reject you let the other end know that the port is unreachable whereas with drop it doesn't give any answer it's as if the server doesn't exist or it's turned off now i'm going to connect on the jesse server and try to ssh this server to see what uh, uh, reply do i get so now I'm on the Jesse server and I'm trying to connect on the other server, on the Debian server. And you can see I don't get any answer because all the packets are dropped. The dropped rule is the first one within the chain and it's matched in this case and all the packets are dropped. Now I'm back on the Debian server and I'm going to delete the drop rule and leave only the reject one to see what happens when the packets are actually rejected instead of dropping. And um, a way of deleting a rule, it's like this, IP tables minus D from delete input and uh, write all the rule, one, the source 192, 168, 12, 133 minus J drop. This is a way of deleting a rule. And another way is to actually specify the rule number within the chain. For instance, when listing the rules, the drop rule is the first one within the input chain and this is the one I want to delete. And I can run like this, IP tables minus D delete input chain, the rule number one. 
but be extra careful with this if you have a longer list of rules not to delete another one. Now I only have the reject rule and I'm going back to the Jesse server and try to connect with SSH on this server. And you can see that I get connection refused on port 22. So this is the difference between the reject and drop targets. Now if you need to modify an existing rule, you can actually replace it like this, minus R replace, the rule number 1 in this case, and the thing you actually want to modify. And in this case, I want to modify the target from reject to accept. This rule is very handy when you want to block a user very, very fast. You can look in the list of rules, and for instance, you have um, a web service, and you see a, an IP that tries to connect, and you don't want it to connect there, actually, which actually it might block your application, or it might return an error, and so on, and you want to block that IP very, very fast, you can enter and you can uh, enter the IP tables and replace that rule like this. Look in the list, see the rule number, IP tables, the input, ROM number one, and block it straight away. Drop or reject. Now, these rules added from the command line on the resist to a reboot. So you need to save them before the reboot, like this, iptables minus save to a certain file, iptables.com, for instance. And after the server booted, you can restore them. etc iptables.conf. And you can also put this within a script if you don't want to manually do them.
TCP dump is a network analysis tool. You can capture packets and also save them for later in order to analyze them. Firstly, you need to install TCP dump package. Now let's see a few examples on how to use TCP dump. If you want to listen on all the interfaces, you can specify minus E, any, and listen to all the interfaces. And if you want to know what interfaces are available, you can run with the option min minus D and display all of them. And now if you want to listen on a specific interface, specify it like this, F0, for instance. And now I'm capturing all the packets that arrive on the F0 interface. You can also save this to a file with dub minus W option. In a file with pcap extension. And now instead of seeing them in the console, you're going to get them directly in a file. And then if you want to read that file, you can replace minus W with minus R and display all the packets that were captured meanwhile. You can also specify the number of packets to capture by using minus C option and it's going to capture all uh, two packets and then stop. You might need to get only the packets from a specific IP. TCP dump minus E interface F0 and specify either the incoming traffic or the outcoming traffic towards a host. So now I'm going to listen for the incoming packets from 192, 168, 12, 133. So TCP dump on the interface at zero, the incoming traffic from host 192, 168, 12, 133. And now I get the packets that come from that server. TCP dump has three verbosity levels. And you can specify them like this with the option minus V. This is the first level, the second level, and the third level. And the more you add, the more information you are going to get. More information from the IP packet, like the total length time and other options. And you can see the difference between the, the two outputs. This one with without verbosity and this one is with verbosity. And you get more information like checksum and other stuff from, from the header. You can also add with minus K Q, which is quiet, to be less verbose, and you get much less information. Then you can search for traffic on one port or, or another. Like this port 22, for instance. And you're going to get only the packets that arrive on port 22, which is SSH. And you can see that all of them contain SSH. Control C for stopping. And then you can specify what protocol to listen for. For instance, TCP, to listen all the incoming traffic on TCP protocol. Or, for instance, ICMP, for ping requests. And now you get all the ping requests. And reply also. You can also look for packets of a particular size by using these options, tcp down minus e f0 of uh, less 32, for instance, or greater 64, for instance. You 
we can also ask not to resolve the uh, name to uh, the IP to names by using minus n from numeric. And now you are getting the IPs instead of name. For instance, for this packet, you are not going to see JC anymore. You are going to see only the IP of it. So these are all basic things you can accomplish with TCP dump. But TCP dump is able to identify far more things. However, uh, these are only examples that help you to get an idea on how to use it. And I also recommend using the man page of TCP dump. Now that you've learned how to capture the packets, you also need to know how to decipher them by identifying the source, the destination, port, and how what kind of packets they are. But before that, uh, you must know that TCP dump doesn't listen only to TCP connections. They uh, It also listens to UDP connections or ICMP connections or ARP connections and many other protocols. So before getting to decipher the packets that I have captured, I want you to understand how the TCP connection works. TCP is a three-way handshake connection, and this is a mechanism created so that two servers that want to communicate one with another can firstly negotiate the parameters of the TCP socket connection before the actual data is transferred. One of the parameters would be how much data to send at once so that the receiver to be able to uh, receive it without colliding. You might also need to know that all the data received is going to be acknowledged. So in this chart, we have the initiator server and the listener server and the initiator that wants to initiate a connection to the listener server sends a SYN packet which says that, hey, I want to communicate with you and I suggest these parameters. And they, they negotiate over the parameters and the listener sends back to the initiator an acknowledgement packet that says, okay, now I'm going to start to communicate with you. And then the initiator sends back, lastly, a third packet that it's actually an acknowledgement of the previously received packet. Now let's back to the TCP dump output. And in this line, for instance, we have uh, the source 192.168.12.133 on port 22. And then the arrow specified the direction of the connection. So the this one initiated the connection towards my server 192.168.12.133. And this responded on port uh, 52111. These flags, uh, in this case, P mean, uh, means push data. Other flags they might have are F from finish connection and S from start connection, R from reset connection, or merely no flag at all. Now regarding how much data to send without colliding. Here we have the sequences from 1 to 61, and these sequences are the sequences uh, from the data stream that they want to send from one server to another. And we have the source uh, server that sends the sequences from 1 to 61. And then we have the destination acknowledge, uh, acknowledging the, the last sequence received. So then the source know that the last one that it was received by the destination is 61. In this case, we have 44 to 88 and 61 to 105. And let's assume that the destination didn't acknowledge the 105 packet and it only acknowledged the 88 one. And then the, the sender knew that they should resend this sequence from 61 to 105 because the destination didn't receive it. The last one received was only 88. So this is how actually the TCP three-way handshake works. All the data that is sent must be acknowledged before another one is going to be sent. In the previous section, I told you about network troubleshooting issues. In this section, however, I'm going to present you a couple of ways to diagnose system issues. I'll help you identify system performance and the resource usage like memory, CPU and disk, also, what swap space is and how you can set it. 
You're also going to learn how to identify running processes and schedule jobs to run regularly or how to check the logs to find out the root causes. Another useful thing when diagnosing a system is to use real-time view tools that give you information of the real-time usage of systems resources and the tasks currently running and managed by the kernel. In the end, you must know that there is no rule of troubleshooting a system, and there are many causes that lead to bottlenecks or processes to crash. There is no checklist that applies to all the cases, so it's better to know of ways to investigate system problems and apply them according to your needs. In this video, I'm going to explain you what swap space is and how to set it so that the system to know when to use it. Swap space is a space on the hard disk that can act as physical memory when the RAM is full. When the system runs out of RAM, then it can use this space on disk to move the inactive pages on it. However, swap space is slower than RAM in what regards the access time and it should be used only when necessary. Swap is also recommended to be a separate partition on disk. So here I have this partition as the A5, which was split within a two logical volume, one for root and one for swap. You can also see it here. So that swap has a, a logical, a separate logical volume. Now let's see how you can configure the system to start using the swap space instead of RAM and when to actually uh, do it. Here it comes in discussion the swappiness, a value between 1 and 100, which tells the system to use swap when a certain percentage of RAM usage is reached. A value of 1 means that only when 99% of RAM usage is reached, it will start using the swap space. On the other hand, when swappiness is set on 100, it will avoid RAM completely and only use swap. By default, most of the systems are configured on a value of 60, but I usually change it on 10 for the servers depending on the needs. Most of the times I change it only when I re realize that um, there are alerts that swap is full and then I figure out that RAM is not used enough to its capacity and the swappiness can be changed to something less. Now if you want to change the current value of swappiness, you can read this file cat proc sys vm swappiness and as I said the default value it's set on 60. Now if you want to temporarily change it until a reboot or crash of the server you can use this command sysctl vm swappiness equal and the value for instance 10. But this is a temporarily change, but if you want to permanently change it, you need to edit this file, etc.ctl.conf. And at the end uh, of the file, you can add this um, option, VM swappiness, and equal the value. Save the file. Mine was already saved because I had modified it previously. And it requires a reboot for the change to take effect. But now, anyways, um, only when RAM it, uh, reaches 90% of usage, it will start uh, moving the inactive pages on the swap space. Because I have set it to 10, so if the value is set on 10, only when usage of the RAM is 90%, it's going to use the swap space. In this video, I'm going to show you how to identify the system's resources and the currently detected devices like PCI and USB devices. Identifying the CPU is very important since matching the software you use to the CPU is very critical. If you want to upgrade your Linux distribution, you should firstly ensure that it's the proper one for your CPU, otherwise it won't work. Here are a few commands to help you identify the CPU model and cores. The first one would be the uname command and with the minus "-a", option, it displays the kernel, Linux kernel version and also the CPU model. So it would be the hostname, the version of the kernel, and then the CPU model, IMD64, and also the architecture, x86-64. Another command would be lscpu. And it also displays the architecture, the CPU operations modes, 
the byte order, little endian, and then the number of the CPUs, and the threads per core, the core per socket, and the number of sockets, and it displays more in detail information. Uh, reading the proc CPU info file, pseudo file, it's actually a pseudo file, and it gives you even more information. And for a multi core CPU, the information would be repeated for each core. And the only um, different line would be the first one, which is the number of the core. But since I have only one core, it displays it only once. If I had had more cores, it would have displayed this part uh, for each core separately. Now, PCI devices are devices that are built in the motherboard and are plugged into the computer's motherboard. The command used to display the PCI devices is LSPCI. And I'm going to pipe less it. So here are the devices plugged in the motherboard. And it can also um, have some levels of verbosity, three levels of verbosity. And if I uh, set minus V, it's one level. And then for more, even more information, double V. And then for even more information about each one of the devices, it can take up to three levels of verbosity. And it's even more information if you need it. And used without any options, LSPCI displays only summary information of the uh, PCI devices. Now for finding out what USB devices are attached to your computer, you can use LSUSB. And it can display information about uh, both the devices attached or the USB controllers themselves. For instance, this one Linux Foundation 2.0 root hub, it's actually a USB controller. Now the ls bleka command is used to display information about the bloke uh, devices like hard disks, flash drives, CD-ROMs, and so on. You can see also the partitions and also to what volume group and um, logical volume they belong. For instance, the volume group for SDA5, it's Debian FG, and then the logical volume, it's root. And then you can see the size and the type and also the mount point. And for instance, for another hard disk, SDB, it has SDB1 partition which belongs to volume group FG opt with the um, logical volume uh, LV opt, the size it's 10 gigabytes, type it's LVM and mount point it's opt partition. And LS uh, K comes with the package EUtil Linux, but it's usually installed by default on many distributions. Another command would be blkid and it's a similar command to lsblk but it also displays the uh, uuid or the universally unique identifier and the type of the file system for instance for sdb1 dev sdb1 this is the uuid the type it's lvm and then the partition id it's this one and for uh, debian volume group with um, root logical volume it also displays the type which is x4 and then for the swap the type it's swap and for the last one would be x4 also uh, you can list the devices by their name only like this bell kid dev sd b1 for instance, and then it displays only this one if you need to find out the UUID of it. Or you can use blkid if you don't know the name, but you only have the UUID, and then you copy uh, the UUID here. Let's 
do like this. In case we only know the UUID but not the name and you want to find out what's the name of the partition. Uh, sometimes uh, BLKID might display devices which no longer exist. So you can use BLKID-J to remove the cache and update the list. But it wasn't the case uh, here. But in case you see more devices that you know that they no longer exist, for instance, after removing a uh, hard disk and the list is not updated, you can run blkid-j to remove the cache. In this video, I'm going to show you how to check the system's resources usage. You may find this very useful when investigating slowness or bottlenecks with your server. For instance, if you use this server as a web service, you need to ensure that you have enough RAM memory not to cause slowness for your users or even crash, uh, have the process crash. The free command it's used to display RAM usage and also the amount of RAM a system has. I usually use it with a minus M option in order to display the output in megabytes. Uh, there is the total co uh, column that provides you the amount of um, RAM on the server, then the used column to see how much it's used, the free command to see uh, what's left unused, and then the buffered, cached, and shared. Then the second line tells you about the swap space, which is 663 megabytes, and the same how much it's used and how much it's free. Another way to check memory usage is to read the pseudo file in proc mem info. Mem info. And I'm going to pipe this output. Pipe less. And then you have the mem total, mem free, mem available, buffers, cached, swap cached, and then uh, swap total, swap free. And so on. It gives you more in detail information about the uh, RAM memory on your server. Um, another important thing is to check out the disk usage. You may need to find out what exactly occupies the most of your space when you need to make some free space, for instance. And then uh, this command, uh, du disk usage minus h from human readable, provides you this kind of information about the disk usage. And it, um, I'm going to go upper a bit. So I'm now in the slash uh, directory. And if I run this command, this usage minus uh, age, it's going to display information about all the files in the system. That's why I'm going to make the display only a certain level. Minus minus max depth one. So I want it to display only one uh, level. So only the sub subdirectories from the location I am um, in. If you want, for instance, to uh, for some folders, it might take longer to calculate the disk usage. So if you want to check only a certain folder or directory. You can specify it. For instance, I want to see um, what's in var. So it displays the subdirectories in var. Or you can merely move in var and run the same command. Without this max depth, it's going to display the disk usage for all the files and subdirectories with uh, under var. But I use, usually use it with uh, this max depth one. And then if I want to go further, I, I change the subdirectory to log, for instance. For instance, you want to identify what's the log that occupies the most of the space. And then you go from directory to subdirectory and so on, from closer to closer to identify maybe the biggest file and to identify why it uh, grew up so much and it filled up your uh, disk. You can add also the minus minus time option to see the last time the files was um, modified. 
So if you don't uh, set the depth, it will display all the files under the directory you are in. In the next video, I will show you a couple of real-time view tools for identifying the system's resource usage. The previous commands that I have shown you only display the resources usage from the moment you check them. But if you want to keep an eye on the usage, then you can use a couple of tools that monitor the resources in real time. But before showing you the utilities or the tools themselves, there's something else that can help you see the real time changes. And that's the watch command. And uh, this watch command will repeat the command any command you put afterwards, like the disk, checking the disk space, uh, it will repeat any command with an interval of two seconds. And it's quite useful to monitor, for instance, the disk space as it's filling up when you transfer data or something like that. When you move data from one server to another and you want to make sure it won't fill up to 100%, you can use this command to watch uh, and it will display every two seconds it will display the output. You can also uh, watch the memory or even uh, IP tables to see, uh, to check how many packets will match the rules in the chains, for instance. And you can see that every two seconds, it uh, it's checking the output. You can also uh, watch the USB devices being plugged in. If you have plugged in something and you want to see when it was detected, you can use this command to watch LSUSB instead of running it yourself. And it will uh, display or repeat the command every two seconds. In the next following videos, I'm going to present you a few real-time utilities that can help you analyze the resources uh, utilization. Now, if you want to analyze real-time usage of the resources, you can use a couple of tools. One of them is IOSTAT. And for uh, being able to use this tool, you firstly need to install the SysStat package. This one, System Performance Tools for Linux, it doesn't come installed by default, so you need to install it uh, previ previously. Now the IOSTAT. It's a tool very useful to analyze uh, disk usage and also CPU statistic uh, and utilizations since the uh, last reboot. The first line displays the kernel version and then the CPU model, the host name, uh, data and architecture of the CPU and also the numbers of CPU you have on the server. Then the second line displays the CPU statistics, such as average CPU usage, or the percentage the CPU was idle and weighted, uh, IO weight, uh, how much it's used with the system tasks, and how much with the user tasks. Also, the third line would display the device utilization uh, report, the number of uh, kilobytes transferred, and the number of kilobytes read per second, written per second, and the total number of kilobytes read and written. You can see how many, you can also set how many times to execute IOSTAT at a specific interval. With this um, syntax, IOSTAT, the uh, interval and the count. For instance, uh, every five seconds to display it for two times. So now I get a report every five seconds for two times. A run without any options will only display one report. You can also view the report only for one device by using minus P option minus P, for instance, SDA. And now I see the report only for the devices from SDA, one, two, and five. Uh, for ext extended information, you can add minus X option. And then you get more columns and more in-detail uh, statistics. 
Now there is another command, top, and it provides a real-time view of the system. It displays information such as the list of, of tasks currently managed by the kernel and also the average CPU usage, the load average, um, by showing the processes in the reverse order of CPU consumption, also memory usage, um, swap usage, and the time since the server has been running, the number of users, the load average is in the last 1 minute, 5 minutes, and 15 minutes. And for exiting this output, you can uh, press K. Uh, Q, sorry. Also, command uptime displays for how long the server has been up and running and the load average in the last 1, 5, and 15 minutes. And for um, a shorter output, but a real time, you can uh, add watch uptime and then it upload, uh, upgrades every two seconds. Control C for breaking. Also top displays the number of um, zombie processes and merely the, the tasks that consumes the CPU in reverse order. And now Q for uh, escaping the output. Another tool would be VMstat. And it displays memory usage statistics. With minus S option, it only displays memory, like the total memory, used memory, active, inactive, free, buffer, swap, and so on. And for um, Displaying the output in megabytes instead of kilobytes, you can add minus uppercase S and M from megabytes. And then you see the numbers in megabytes, Nine, 986 megabytes total memory and how much it's used and so on. Then when I run without S, minus S um, option, it, it, it displays more categories like uh, CPU, swap, and um, IEO, input-output. For instance, for PROX category, uh, there uh, is R, uh, and that's the number of processes waiting for runtime. And then B, it's the number of processes in uh, interruptible sleep. And then for memory, we have uh, SWPD, and that's the virtual memory used. Free, it's for free memory. And the buffer, it's... Uh, memory used as buffered and cache, memory used as cache. Uh, for swap, there are uh, SE for swap in and SO for swap out of the disks. Then there is BI and BO for input output and that's the number of blocks in and blocks out per second. And then for a system category, there is in for uh, interrupts per second and CS for context switches per second. And regarding CPU, it's like in the other tools. Um, US for user time, SY for kernel jobs, and ID for idle, and uh, WA for waiting for um, uh, IEO. You can also make VMstat display the output for more times within a certain a specified interval. For instance, in megabytes, I want to see it every two seconds for three times. And then it displayed it for three times. Another tool would be IO top. And it's a similar command um, to top, but for disk uh, I.O. usage. Uh, before using I.O. top, you need to install the package I.O. top. And it works only as root. Uh, for instance, when you might experience a slowness on your system and realize that there's enough memory 
and also there is enough this space, but you don't know where the problem is coming from. Then the issue might be from the I.O. and the CPU usage. And IOTOP displays the disks uh, write and read, also the swap in and the command that produces the actual um, usage. Uh, for displaying only the processes that actually do I.O., you can run I.O. with minus minus only option. And you can also uh, use the arrows to change the column for sorting. And also you can um, use the R key to reverse sorting order. And again, Q for uh, quitting. In the sysstat package I told you about in the previous videos, there is not only the IOSTAT real-time uh, view tool for identifying your system's resources usage. There are other, uh, many other tools that help you identify the usage. One of them is SAR. And so it's very useful and it's different than the others because it also provides historical data about your system. It doesn't only provide, uh, it's not only a real time view tool. It doesn't only provide the data from now, but it can also provide you data from uh, today, the whole day or yesterday or the previous days, or since you started the Sysstat uh, process. For instance, uh, running SAR without any option, it provides CPU usage from today, since I started the Sysstat uh, process, from every 10 minutes. And then if you want to provide uh, to display uh, memory usage, you can use minus R option. Or if you want to display um, swap, you can run with minus S or IO uh, transactions with minus B. And you can see transaction per seconds, uh, re uh, read transactions per seconds, and write transactions per, per seconds, and bytes read per second, and so on. Now SAR can provide also information about uh, now, in this very moment. And you can use about, uh, for instance, memory to display every two seconds two outputs. And this provides you the memory usage from now. But let's assume you had some spikes in your systems last night, some slowness or something that happened and it hasn't happened before and it doesn't happen now, so you cannot get information about it now, but you need to get information about last night. So how can you find that out? Well, simply see stats uh, create some uh, files in uh, var log sysstats a file for each day i only have one because i have started my uh, sysstat process only now or today but if uh, and they are usually named sa and the date so for instance if i want to find out about what has happened last night in my system then you can um, run SAR with F and the file to read from. And it displays everything uh, within that day. This is for uh, CPU usage, but if you want uh, memory usage, then you can run um, SAR minus R, var log C stat SA minus F, I forgot the minus F for reading from the file. And then if you want from a certain hour, you can run with minus Q minus S and provide the hour. I only want to display um, from after 11 o'clock. And then I get the output only after 11 o'clock. Because if you display without specifying a timestamp, it displays everything from uh, that day, from every 10 minutes, and it might be a lot of information. So in order to uh, narrow down the hour you need to find out about, you can specify the time like this. But in order to have this data collected, you, net, you need to enable Sysstat to collect that data. And then you need to specify this uh, in this file, etc default sysstat 
and set enabled on true. By default, when you install CSTAT, it's set on false, but you need to modify it to set it on true in order to be able to collect data. So if you want only to find out about now, you specify, for instance, minus B, IO transactions to, ev to outputs every two seconds. And then I get this. So sorry is very useful and it has uh, much more, it can provide much more information, not only about CPU usage or memory or swap or IEO transactions, it can provide mu much more information. So in order to find out about everything SAR can provide, I recommend you to read the man page of SAR. And here you can find out about all the options you can uh, use in order to find out the data you need to investigate your problem. If you want to list the open files in your system, you can use this command ls off that displays information about files that are opened by different processes. And you can pipe less this output to see less. And uh, it outputs one file per line. And the columns are quite intuitive. A command is the command that opened that file. The PID is the process ID user and then fd is the file descriptor and it can take values like uh, cwd from current working directory or uh, txt from text file and mem from memory mapped file or mmap from um, memory mapped device and then the number represents the file descriptor these numbers uh, then the type it's the type of the file and it can be dir from directory or reg from regular file or uh, chr from character special file 
And for more information regarding the types of the files, you can read man ls off when you need it. Uh, let's see a few examples of using ls off. And you can check the open file within a certain directory. For instance, ls off in dev, and it displays all the open files within slash dev and the command that opened them, and also the user and the process ID. Then you can see, um, you can list the processes that opened a certain file. ls off, for instance, varlog syslog. Uh, syslog. I want to see um, who opened this file. And then you can see that the rsyslogd, the daemon that logs messages, opened varlog syslog. And you can also list um, files opened by a process. ls off minus c rcslogd and you get all the open files opened by rcslogd you can also uh, specify the user to see all the open files by a certain user and here are all the files the user carbon had opened and they are still open you might find this uh, ls off command very useful when you want to unmount something and it returns an error that the device is still in use or it's busy. And you can check what uses that mount point and investigate further if they can be killed so that you uh, to be able to unmount the directory. For instance, I want to unmount uh, this mount point, dev mapper fg opt. And I get this error that the target is busy and uh, some files seem to be open. And I can check ls of um, opt to see what files are open there. And you can kill these uh, tasks if you want to uh, unmount the mount point. But make sure you don't kill something that someone else is using at that very moment. So be very careful with this kill command when unmounting something. And then I'm, I'm killing both of them. And now if I check, there's still this one that hasn't killed. Now I, nothing seems to be open on opt partition, so then I should be able to unmount the devmapper fg opt uh, that is mounted on the opt partition. I can unmount it successfully now. So you can see that it's not here anymore. Checking the log files is an important step in diagnosing an issue with uh, your server or the software installed on your server. They help you debug servers that don't behave as supposed to. Or you can get information about user authentication or how many files a web service has processed. Or you can see errors, warnings, or uh, merely information logs that help you understand the state of your system or soft software when it crashed, for instance. Uh, the demo responsible with logging is rsyslog, and the configuration file is in etcrsyslog.conf. And in this file, you can find configurations on where to log certain messages from different services. Uh, let's take a look at the rules section this section and the format of uh, the rules is facility dot priority and then the action whereas facility is the tool or service uh, that generates the logs like for instance mail in this case is the facility and then the priority it's the the priority of the message and it can take values like debug, info, notice, warning, error from error, crit from critical, alert, and emerg from emergency in this uh, ascending order. Em emerg messages are the most important ones and indicate serious problems. And then you can specify what kind of messages to go to what file. Or you can specify that messages from a certain priority higher to go to a specific file. For instance, in this case with mail.info, all the info uh, messages are going to be logged in var log mail info. And then all, all the warning messages are going to be logged in var log mail warning. 
and in in the last uh, case mail.r all the messages from this uh, priority higher so all the messages starting with the error priority meaning error critical alert and emergency are going to be logged in uh, in this file var log mail r so only uh, priority higher than error and not below error if you want to uh, log the um, messages with a priority lower than r then you can set the exclamation mark before it and it's going to log all the messages below error priority or if you specify uh, equal error, it will only log messages with this only priority to, to a certain file. But without any option, uh, it will log all the priority um, from error and higher. Uh, the asterisk replace all the priorities, like in this case, user dot asterisk uh, replaces all the priorities, and you can have um, user dot uh, asterisk um, logged in var log user log meaning all the user um, all the user uh, messages are going to be logged in in the same file no matter the priority so the action the last part of the format uh, the action it's um, the file name and it might also display the messages on the console like this uh, dev console or you can specify another server a remote server to send the logs to for security purpose and you can specify like this with at log server.com for instance uh, in the next video i'm going to show you how to actually read the log files so as i said in the previous video reading the log files it's quite important to figure out the root cause of a problem but firstly, you need to know what files to read depending on the problem that you have. The log files are usually stored in var log. In a var log. And maybe the software you install might have a different location for the log files or they create subdirectories or files directly within the var log directory. Let's take for instance Apache. So it created a subdirectory within var log. Uh, they log messages independently of RC's log daemon. So you need to take a look at their configuration files to find out where they store the logs. The names of the files are not the same in all the distributions, in all the Linux distributions. So you might need to take a look around and discover what's in the log files yourself. Uh, there are some important files such as uh, DMESG that holds um, information from kernel ring buffer from booting time. It helps you find out information from boot time afterwards in case you need to investigate if some devices were found at boot or any other issues related to boot time. Also, last log. Uh, it holds binary data and it contains all the users last login time. And if you want to view it, you just type last log in the terminal. So you get the time a user has logged in, if it, have, uh, if, if it has ever logged in. Or if you want to look for a user in particular, last log minus u and the username. Uh, last log. So you can see that the last time a uh, user Carmen has logged in was in, on, sat on Saturday, April 8th, and also the hour. Another important uh, log file is messages. And it contains general data, especially from the kernel. Another one would be syslog. Again, it contains uh, system log data. Also, uh, there's a directory apt for Debian and it contains history from all the packages installed. You can see that I have installed the sysstat packages on the 8th of April 
and also the hour and the end date. And then I have also installed the atop on the same date. And the package name that I was installed, uh, it was installed and also the end date. And in term log, you get the messages that were displayed on the console while I installed the packages. So you can check the log files to monitor your system or programs installed on the server. Let's take for example that you have a Java application running on your server that crashes quite often, so you don't know the reason why. So by investi investigating the logs, you find out that there is a, maybe an out of memory issue. So you can solve the problem by simply increasing the memory, the RAM memory, or by allocating more to the Java process itself. Or you can investigate maybe load problems if your server works as a web server and it's very slow for the users and you can monitor it and eventually to increase the resources so that to improve its performance. There are also a couple of tools to help you read the log files. The files are sometimes very long and they are filled up quite fast. So it's important when searching the log files to be able to use tools that narrow the search to what you're interested to. Uh, there are some tools that help you check the beginning of a file and others that help you check the end of a file or others that merely uh, help you search the file for a specific piece of information. If you want to search the first part of a log file, then you can use the tool head. And with the option minus N, you can display the first um, 10 lines of a file and then the uh, log the file name. So these are the first 10 lines of the history log. You can also use less. But I'm going to take another file that's a bit longer. Less syslog, for instance. And it displays a page on the screen at a time. So if you want to go to the next page, then you'll press the page down button. So you can go page by page to look for for what you're interested and Q for quitting. For checking the end of the log file for an immediate change or merely to watch them as the messages come in uh, into the log file, then you can use tail. And the same as with head, you specify the number of lines you want to display. So these are going to be the last line of a file. So I'm going to display the last 10 lines of the syslog file. But with tail, you can also view the log messages in real time mode. You can maybe perform an operation and also want to watch the logs as they occur or you, in order to check an immediate result or whatever you want to check. Maybe you expect an error and you want to, to make sure so you are watching the logs to see what, what's happening while you are doing something else. So the same, it's I'm going to use tail with minus F option or minus minus follow, either of them. And the name of the log, let's say syslog. So you, you will be able to see the real time logs as they are coming into the syslog file. But for now, I, I don't have anything happening on the server, so there is no new messages. But you can also watch all the logs. Maybe you are looking for something and you don't know exactly in what file they are going to be logged. So you can search for the whole directory by typing asterisk instead of the log file. So you get all the logs file, the last lines of the each log file in var log. And if the new messages are coming in, you would be able to see them in real time. And control C for breaking the output. Now, if the lines you're looking for are somehow placed in the middle of the file, or you don't know where exactly they are or in which file they are, then you can use grep to search for a string in either a file or in all of them. 
again, if you don't know in which file the messages are looking, uh, you're looking for is located. And let's assume you want to look for the F0 network interfa interface in var log. And you get the file name in var log syslog. And the line, the F0, the string you are looking for, is located. So this is the output of grep. The file name and then the, the line, the string you are looking for, for is located. Or you can also search for a certain user to see what operation they performed var log again in all the files and you can see that the uh, user carmen in var log daemon log or in um, var log sys log starting session for user carmen also less the tool less supports search uh, with uh, the sys log for instance with slash key and let's search for Carmen and it take, takes you to the next occurrence and by pressing slash again it takes you to the next occurrence and so on and you, you can also get to the end of the file by pressing escape and also greater than symbol so I'm now at the end of the file and you can search backwards by using the question mark so it takes you to the previous occurrence and again the question mark and enter it takes you to the previous one and so on. Although all these operations I have shown you, uh, you can perform them with a simple text editor. I don't recommend you to use a text editor when viewing the logs since you can alter the file and also it can be much much slower especially if the file is very large. Log files can grow huge and therefore it can fill up all the available space on the partition they are located. Also it would be difficult for you to search on a file that has log entries from a few months ago, for example. So in order to avoid this kind of problems, there is a tool called Log Rotate. This tool renames and compresses the log files and can also delete the old ones and make the program that generates the log messages use the new log files. Then uh, you can take a look here at the debug log, for instance. The current one is this one. And then the other ones are rotated. So the logs messages are only generated in, in the current one and the other ones are rotated. The configurations and default options um, for log rotates is in etc.logrotate.conf. And then there is also a directory, logrotate.d, that contains application specific logs. So firstly, LogRotate reads the default options in etc.logrotate.conf and then it reads in etc.logrotate.d directory for specific application logs. So this overrides the options in etc.logrotate.conf. Uh, now the etc.logrotate.conf contains the main options that LogRotate uses when rotating the logs, such as how often to rotate the logs. For instance, uh, here it's specified weekly, but it can take values like daily, monthly, or even yearly. And then the rotate command determines how many RFID logs to keep at a time. If there are four already, then the last one will be deleted to make room for the new archive when rotating. Let's see this example. For instance, you can see that there are only four rotated logs, the debug one, debug two, debug three, and debug four. And when 
the debug, the current log is going to be rotated, then the last one, debug4, it's also going to be deleted in order to make room for, for the next one. So there are always all, only four archived uh, or rotated log at a time. You can also specify the size of uh, the file. When it reaches a certain size of the log file, uh, then log rotate will rotate the file. Uh, you can specify size like 100 kilobytes or 100 megabytes. And if you have set both the frequency and also the size, then the size command has priority. So if you have set, for example, log rotate to run weekly, but the log file reaches the size limit, then log rotate will rotate the file as no matter if it's sooner than weekly. Uh, the compress option. It's uh, to choose if you want to, the rotated logs to be compressed as a gzip archive. This is recommended since the logs can grow huge and occupy too much disk space. And if you still need some logs uncompressed and others you want them compressed, then you can specify that separately in the configuration file for uh, the, each application in etc log rotate.d. It can also uh, take another value, no compress. It means that it's not going to compress them. Or another one uh, might be delay compress. And this requires compress to be active. And delay compress means that the compression is going to be delayed until the next time the log rotate runs. So firstly, the log is going to be rotated, like in this case. Firstly, the log is going to be rotated, and then the next time it will rotate the current log, it will compress the previous rotated log file. For instance, now we have one uncompressed and the other three are compressed. So the next time it's going to rotate the current one, this debug one, it's going to compress this one, debug.1, and this is going to be transformed in debug.2, and then debug.2 in debug.3, and debug.3 in debug.4, and then the last one, it's going to be deleted. Uh, this option, it's important when you have a program that still writes log messages to the old log file after the rotation, so you might need to specify uh, to delay the compression. Now let's take a look at the logrotate.d directory. Where there are the uh, where the application logs are. Um, for instance, for apt. There are two log files. So this is the format. You specify the log file and then the options within the brackets. So rotate 12 means that uh, 12 rotated and archived logs will be kept and they are going to be rotated monthly and compressed as gzip. Missing OK means that if the file is missing, it will go to the next one without returning any error. And not if empty means that it will not rotate the log if it's empty. And then the same one for, for the history log within the apt directory. Let's take another look at the Apache log. So they are going to be rotated daily. Missing OK, it's if the file is missing, it will return no error. Rotate 14, it will keep 14 rotated and archived log, logs files. And then it they are going to be compressed, but with a delay, as I explained you earlier not if empty and it, it will create a file with this access rights for the root user and other group and then post rotate this one here it's um, the script run each time the log rotate runs or after log rotate runs it's usually used to restart an application after the log rotation so that to force it to use the new log file so this script here, it checks the status of Apache and then Apache is going to be reloaded. And the uh, dev null means that the output will be piped to nowhere. And then the end script says that the script is done. 
Maybe you've noticed the previous option that is shared scripts. And it, it, it means that um, no matter how many log files are matching the following options, you can see here that all the logs files within the Apache directory are going to be checked and rotated. So no matter how many files, log files are rotated at the same time, this script here, it's going to be run only once for all of them. So if, for instance, you have three uh, log files that matches this uh, criteria and they are going to be um, rotated at the same time, only once the Apache is going to be reloaded. So not, not three times for each one of them, but only once. So this is specified within this option, uh, shared scripts. And then the end script says the script is done. And there's another one uh, prior to rotating the logs. And then it's RC's log, for instance. Let's take a look at this file also. And there are a few options for uh, var log syslog file. It will keep seven. They are going to be rotated daily. And the options that you've already seen. And also if you have more log files that you want to match the same options, you can specify them one after another. And then the options within the brackets. Scheduling jobs is quite useful when administering a Linux server. You might find it helpful when scheduling a log rotate job to rotate your logs and free some disk space, or when you want to back up your database every day at a certain hour or even more times a day. So knowing how to schedule jobs is mandatory. Now there are more utilities used for scheduling jobs. One of them is cron and is more preferred as it can schedule jobs on a recurring basis. Another one is at and it's more used for scheduling one time task in the future. It's only for non recurring tasks. And this is the one I'm going to present in this video. At command can be used for shutting down the system at a specified time in the future or for starting a process. Let's assume you have stopped the process for maintenance uh, and you want to make sure you don't forget to start it. Then you can use at to start it over a couple of hours when you estimate the maintenance is over. Or you can schedule uh, to send an email as reminder at a certain time in the future. In order to schedule a job, you need to run at command followed by the time you want to schedule the job. Let's say at, at 13 and 30. And now in the at prompt, specify the command to be run. Let's say ls minus l to list the directories. And control D to exit the prompt. Now for listing the queue of the jobs scheduled, you can run atq. And if you run ATQ as root, you will see all the jobs scheduled by all the users. But if you run it as non-root user, it will only display the jobs scheduled by that specific user. Let's switch to user Carmen. And now schedule a job. And list it. And you can see that I'm only able to see the job I have scheduled as user Carmen. But if I switch back to root and list the queue, you can see that now I see both the job I have scheduled as user Carmen and also as user, user root. You can also check the content of the job with at minus C and the, the job ID. So ATQ returns the list of jobs and the first field is the job ID and then the date, execution date and time and also the user that has scheduled that job. And you can list the content of one job with at minus C and the job ID. And you get the script behind ls minus L command. 
you can also remove a job that was scheduled by running at rm from at remove and the job id 34 and you can see that job uh, the previous job id 34 has disappeared now other examples of the at command might be at 9 a.m on Sunday and this will schedule a job on the next Sunday at 9 a.m. And you can see it here. Or you can specify the date April 20. And you can see this one. And you can also specify the date in numeric form, like at 9, 21, 21st of April 2017. And you can see this one. And you can specify uh, tasks to be run next month. And it will schedule a job on the, the same date as today, but next month at 9, 9 o'clock. And you can see it here. And let's list it. And this is the command that will be executed on the 18th of May. We can also schedule one tomorrow. or over an hour from now, or over a year from now. And you can see this job, it was uh, scheduled to run over a year from today, or even midnight. And it scheduled the task to be executed at 12 a.m. Now the add commands are run in the background, so you won't be able to see the output of the command you have scheduled to run in the future. If you want to make sure the command has been run successfully, then you either check the add queue to, to see if it has disappeared or to direct the output on your terminal. But firstly, you need to find out the terminal. And now let's schedule a job and redirect its output towards your terminal. Uh, now over two minutes. and redirect it on the terminal, on my terminal. Control D. And now let's wait two minutes to, to see the output of it. So this is the output of the previous command I have scheduled. And now Control C to break it. So as you can see, it is quite intuitive regarding setting the time. And in the next video, I will present you the other utility I have told you about, the cron. Cron is the utility used to schedule jobs in the future on a recurring basis. It's very used and helpful.
to run jobs periodically in the future, either backing up data or rotating logs, or simply to connect to a time server to keep your server synchronized. The daemon behind the cron tool is cron, cron d, and it's started by the init process. The cron d daemon checks the cron tab files every minute and see if there are any tasks to be run. Cron tab are the files or tables where you schedule the jobs. The jobs are referred to as cron jobs. There are two types of cron jobs. One is system cron jobs that handle tasks for the operating system. An example would be the log rotate job. Another type of cron jobs is the user cron jobs, and the users can set up to run their own jobs in their own cron tab files. Now, etc cron tab is the file that controls the system cron jobs. And here are the lines that schedule uh, the jobs. And they have five fields for time specification. The first one is the minute, and it can take values between 0 and 59. And then the hour can take values between 0 and 23. The day of the month can take values between 1 and 31. The month, it they can take values between 1 and 12. And the day of the week can take values between 0 and 7, where both 0 and 7 mean Sunday. Also for the month and um, the day of the week, you can use the first three letters instead of numbers. For instance, here you can use sun from Sunday. And the month you can use May for the fifth month. Now for multiple values, you can place an asterisk for all the values in the interval. For instance, the first job runs at minute 17 at each hour, each day of the, mo the month, each month, and each day of the week. Or you can make a list and separate the values with a comma. For instance, I want the job to run each day at minute 17, 25, and 30. Or you can also use a dash to specify an interval, and this will run the job every minute or at each value from that interval, including the beginning and the end. So in this case, it will run the job um, at minute 17 and all the values towards the value of 30, including the minute 30. Or if you want to run a job for, let's say, every 17 minutes, you place an asterisk and a slash. And it will, it will run the job every 17 minutes. Then you need to specify the user to be used when running the job. And lastly, the command. The utility that will run the executable script and the directory to read the scripts from. And they are named uh, according to the frequency, cron hourly, and here are the scripts that should be run hourly at minute 17. And then cron daily. And these are the scripts to be run every day at minute 25 at, at hour 6. So it's 6.25 every day. It will run all the scripts uh, that are located in, the, in this directory in etc cron daily. And then cron weekly contains scripts that should be run every once a week. And you can see that they are run on Sunday at 6.47 and cron monthly. They will be run on the first day of the month at 6.52. In order to create a system cron job, <coughs> you need to create a script in one of the folders specified here. Depending on the frequency, you need the script to be executed, either hourly, daily, weekly or monthly. Now, if you want to create user cron jobs, things are a bit different than with system cron jobs. 
uh, you need to use the cron tab utility. And it's different than the file etc cron tab, so make sure you don't confuse them. Let's switch to a normal user. And the utility uses cron tab. And with uh, cron tab takes a few options. And one of them is minus L to list the jobs. And also minus U to specify the user. But minus U and the username is not mandatory since it will take the current user. If you don't specify it, it will take the current user. So you can see that now, for now, there are no user cron job for user Carmen. And then there are two more options. And it's minus E to edit and add a user cron jobs and minus R that deletes all the cron jobs for that user. Before I will show you how to add a user cron job, let's create a script to be executed. Nano test sh and bin sh echo this is a test user cron job. Save the file and let's give it executable rights to it. And now let's create a user cron job. And I want it to run every minute, every hour, every day of the month, every month, every day of the week. And you don't need to specify the user here, since it will take the current user, only specify the command to be executed. Save the file and let's list. And now you can see the user cron job here. Now user cron jobs are stored in, in a var spool cron cron tabs but i i don't have permissions to access that folder or that directory with the current user so i'll switch to root and go to var spool cron cron tabs and now you can see that there's a file for user carmen and you either list it like this Or you can merely open the file with the text editor. So only root is allowed to see the other user's cron jobs. But as user Carmen, I can see my own with minus cronta minus L. Now the output of the task executed will be sent as email to the current user. So let's check the mail. In var mail ls and at the end of the uh, file it should be the the output of the script but the file seems to be quite long so Let's read it like this. Tail Carmen. So you can see that the last the last line is the output of the user cron job. This is a test user cron job. One thing you should consider regarding cron is that all the system cron jobs storage directories should be owned by root. Let's go to the directories to see them. So all these directories should be owned by root. No other user should have permissions to edit them as they can, they can create jobs to give themselves administrative access to the system. So in the next video, I will present you a complementary tool for cron called Anacron. Anacron is a complementary tool for cron. Cron by default assumes that your server is up and running all the time. But if you switch off your server and you have jobs scheduled to be run during that time, those will never be run actually. 
Let's assume you have scheduled a weekly job to run at 6 a.m. in the morning, and once a week you switch it off or restart it at that time. The task will never be run eventually. Therefore, Anachron appeared to solve this issue. It keeps a history of the cron jobs to see the last time they were executed. If your computer was off at 6 a.m. and it was supposed to run a job at that time every day, then Anachron will see that the task has not been run that day and it will execute it properly. But Anachron should be installed. Sometimes it doesn't come by itself. So you should install the package Anachron before using it, or if you want to use it. The Anachron table is located in etc Anachron tab and it's similar to the cron tab file. However, it does not have five fields for time specification. The smallest time unit to anachron is the day. So the first field is the interval in days, and one means every day, two means every two days, and seven means once a week. So you can see that it, it can only run the jobs in cron daily and cron weekly. It doesn't run the jobs in cron hourly, for instance. The second field is the delay before executing the command. Anacron will run once in a while. It's not a daemon. So once it's running, it will start executing the jobs from Anacron tab. So if you want some delay between executing the jobs, you can specify it here so that not to have them executed all at once or all at the same time. If you want to test the Anacron tab file, you can run Anacron minus the uppercase. And you can see that I get an error, that it's an unnamed period in line 13. So nano minus C, it is C anachron tab. And now I'll go to the line 13, which is also the last, the last line. And it seems that B monthly is not a time period accepted by anachron. Therefore, it will return an error. So I'll delete B and I only let monthly. Save the file and now run it again. And you can see that it doesn't return anything and it means that the file is all right now. Now the default spool directory for Anacron is in um, var spool Anacron. And it contains files that store information such as when a job was executed. Let's um, view cron daily, for instance. And this is the date when the, file, the job was lastly executed. And you can also force anacron to run with anacron minus D and minus F to force it. And it will run all the jobs in Anacron tab file, but with a delay, with the delay specified in the file. So as you could see, the cron daily will run with 5 minutes delay, and 10 minutes delay for cron weekly, and 15 minutes delay for cron monthly, as you saw in etc Anacron tab. So the delay that was specified here, 5 minutes since the Anacron starts, and then 10 minutes since the Anacron process starts and the lastly 15 minutes since the anachron starts. So this is how you can schedule or how you can check if a job that you have scheduled with cron has run or not. If you, for instance, has rebooted the server in that very minute when the schedule was supposed to run. I hope you find this uh, very useful for your server when you schedule jobs.
In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up the network file system. So on this half of the console, I have the server that is going to become the network file system server. And then on the right half, I have the server that is going to be the client. So on the server side, you need to install this package called NFS kernel server, which I have already installed. So once installed, you need to uh, create a directory that is going to be shared across the network. And I want it to be in var nfs. Now that you have set up the directory, you need to configure the sharing. So the file that controls that is in etc exports. And the syntax is quite simple. You specify the directory that is going to be shared, followed by the address of the client and some options within the brackets. So I'm going to review some of the options, the most usual ones used with uh, exports, but for more options, you can check the main page of exports. So here are the most usual ones. Read write, which gives the client read write access to the shared files or directory, or read only, if you want to limit the access. Then it's sync, which makes NFS reply to all the clients after the changes were committed to stable storage. And this helps the client to be updated to the last state of the volume shared. Another one is no subtree check. And it disables the subtree checking. And it's when there are only some subdirectories exported, but not the whole file system, then when NFS receives a request, it will check if the requested file is in the appropriate file system and also if it's in, in the exported tree. And this is called subtree check. So if you want to disable it, you need to specify the no subtree check option. Another one would be root squash. And NFS translates the request from the client as root user on anonymous user. So this increases the security as they don't have root access on the files uh, that are shared. And the opposite of this option is no root squash and it disables the translation of users. So if you are a root on the client server, then you can create files and modify them as root on the NFS server also. Now save the file and export fs-a for the change to take effect. And you can also use the export fs command to display the exported directories. Once the server is set up, let's move to the client side, where you need to install the package called nfs common. And now let's create a directory uh, where the shared files will be mounted. and mount to the NFS mount point. And let's check if it was mounted. And you can see it here. Now let's modify the files to check the access rights that the client has. So let's move to the NFS directory, which you can see it's empty, and I'm going to create a file. And now on the server side, I can see the file created. And you can see it has root access. It has root ownership. So I'm going to modify that file to check if I have access. Save the file, and on the server side, you can see the change. But now on the server side, I'm going to modify the export options. So I'm going to replace no root squash with root squash option. Export fs minus a. And now on the client side, I'm going to modify the test file again.
and when trying to save it, it says permission denied. And this is because of that option, a root squash, it's enabled now. But if I change the ownership of that file from the server side to the anonymous user, nobody, no group, then now I should be able to modify the file. And you can see that I was able to modify it because it has the ownership of the anonymous user and it's not root anymore. But let's try to create another file. And it says permission denied because I have only changed the ownership of the test file and not to the whole directory uh, in var nfs. But if I had changed the ownership of the nfs directory too, I would have been able to create uh, any files I wanted from the client side. Now let's go again to the exports file and replace the read write option with read only. Save the file and export FS again. And you can see that I get another error that there is read only file system. So this was for you to figure out how those options work and to know how to play around them in order to grant the proper access to the clients. Another thing I wanted to show you is those processes that run in the background of NFS. And they're usually called with RPC. RPC.stat D, RPC IDMAPD, RPC unmount D, and RPC bind. So these run in the background and you don't have to even to start them. Once you start the NFS kernel server, they would start automatically. But just to be aware of them.
In this section, I'm going to show you how to deal with user management by creating and deleting the users, creating groups and assigning users to a group, and also deleting the groups altogether. You will also learn how to enable users and group quotas so that to limit a user on the, on the amount of disk space a user or a group can have. So let's start an added user. And the command for adding a user is user add followed by the name of the user. For instance, user add John. So when you firstly create an user, it will be in the lock state. So the passwd command John will unlock it by setting it a password. And now I can enter the password and the password was updated successfully and the account was unlocked. Uh, the user is visible in the etc passwd file and it's usually the last line added. So you can see the username and the password, which is encrypted as it, and it's kept in the etc shadow file, the user ID and the group ID, also the home directory and the shell, which I'm going to change for bin bash and save the file. Now let's switch to user John. And you can see that it says no directory. It was uh, logging in with home setting on the slash directory. So I'm going to go back to the root account and I'm going to create a home directory for John. And now giving ownership on John, user John and group John for the home John directory. Now switching to user John, you can see that it logged in in the home directory of John. Now going back to root, if you want to add a user that is going to have that home directory already created, you can use the minus M option. And now switching to user Carla, it's you can see that it has the home Carla directory already created. But the reason it appears like this is because it's set on bin sh instead of uh, bin bash. So I'm going to change this again from the etc passwd file. Going to user Carla and set the bin sh on bin bash. Now switch to user Carla. And you can see that it has the home directory home Carla. It's because I added this minus M option. And if you want to see all the options, you just uh, type user add minus minus help and you can see all the options. And another important option, you might uh, use its minus D option, which is going to um, create a home directory anywhere else where you specify it. For instance, let's add a user, user add minus D on, let's say, var log for the logger user. So I'm going to create a logger user that's going to have the home directory set on the var log file uh, directory. So now switch to the logger, checking where it logged in. You can see that it was um, logged in on var log as its own home directory. Now if you want to create a user that is not going to have any home directory at all, you can use minus M with uppercase, for instance, and whatever user you want, test, for instance. So if I switch to test, again, it says it has no directory logging in with home on the slash directory because I have specified this minus M option.
In this video, I'm going to present you what a user and group quotas are. So, quotas are used to limit the disk space a user or group can have on your server. For instance, your server runs FTP for the file transfer and you have a list of users, but you want to make sure that one user doesn't occupy all the disk space available for all the other ones by transferring large files. Therefore, you have the option to limit the amount of disk space a user can have by dealing with quotas. But in order to limit the users, you need to firstly install this package uh, quota from the standard repository, and I've already installed it. Uh, now you need to edit the mount options for the file system you want to apply quota on. And you can perform this from the etc fs tab file. And go to the file system you want to enable quota on. And I'm going to enable it on the root file system since I want to limit the users that have directories in, in the home directory. And here are the options. I'm going to uh, add the option user quota. And if you want to enable also the group quota, you will add this option too. But in this video, I'm going only to deal with the user quota and the procedure for the group quota. It's very, very similar. Now save the file and remount the file system. Now that you remounted the root file system, you need to create a quota file in the root directory. And it's a file that Quota tool will use to keep the information of the user's disk size. And it contains the limits that you set on the users as well as the configuration options. And you can perform the, that with the Quota check command. And run without any parameters is going to display all the available parameters. So I'm going to use Quota check minus C from create. Uh, user, U from user, and M from do not remount file system read only on the slash directory. And this might take a few seconds. Now let's enable quota on the file system uh, root. And you can do this by running, but firstly, let me clear up the screen to make it more visible quota on and then the file system and the opposite of this command is quota off uh, that will disable checking the disk for the user and groups now let's configure the quota for the user john and the command is add quota followed by the user and it will open up a file for you in the uh, default editor, text editor. And in this file, you can add the limit of disk a user might use. So firstly, it specify the file system. Uh, the quota is enabled on. Then the block is the amount of blocks used by that user. And currently, there are none used. And then the soft block is the limit set for the user as well as um, the hard block, a hard number of blocks. And the difference between the soft blocks and the hard blocks is that when the soft block limit is reached, the user will get a warning and the user is still able to use the disk space for a specified period of time called the grace period. Whereas the hard limit is the maximum amount of space the user is um, allowed to use and above that, this, the user is not allowed to upload or create any other files once this hard limit is reached. And then the E nodes is the number of E nodes used by the user. And again, it's zero because there are no files in the home directory of John. And then the soft E node is the limit of the E nodes used of um, or the number of files or folders that the user can have. So here at soft, if I specify two, it means that this is the limit of files the user John is able to create or upload. upload. And then the hard enode is the same, the limit of the enodes used, and the difference between soft and hard is the same as with the soft and hard blocks. So when the soft uh, limit of enodes is reached, the user is still able to uh, upload or create other files for a grace period of time if 
the soft uh, number of inodes d it's of course uh, less than the hard number of inodes but usually the number of blocks is used instead of the number of inodes or the limit is set on the disk space instead of the number of files so you'd rather specify um, or limit a user to use let's say one 100 megabytes of disk space instead of specifying the number of files like let's say a specified um, like the user carla it's only able to have five files on its home directory so it's usually specified the disk space or the size and not the number of files or folders now let's set up some limits for the user john and for instance soft let's specify 100 here which is kilobytes and here 200 and whereas for the number of files usually it's uh, recommended to let it here zero which is uh, it doesn't mean, actually mean zero. It means that the user is able to have unlimited number of files and folders. But in order just to check how it works, I'm going to set here two files for the soft limit and four files for the hard um, limit. Save the file. And the command quota john is used to check the quota for user john. And you can see there is none. Not yet because it has no files and um, directories in its home directory. And if you want to generate the report, you can do this with the rep quota minus A. And you will see how many are used and also the grace period. And if you want to edit the grace period, you can uh, use the add quota command with minus t option but this is only possible for all the users so you cannot have different grace periods for different users and you can see that by default it's set on seven days but it can take other um, time units as well like days hours minutes or seconds and it's different on blo block grace period and on inode grace period
I created this video in order to show you some of the tricks or some of my habits I will be using during the course, what text editor I use and how I browse through the directories and how I deal with the history. This will help you keep the pace and understand better what I will be showing you throughout the course. First of all, the text editor I use is Nano. And this is only a matter of preference. Others use VI or VIM, but I prefer to use Nano. And in order to use Nano, you firstly need to install the package called Nano. So if you want to open up a file, you just press nano, type Nano and the name of the file. And you can also use the tab key for autocomplete. Now that I'm in the file, I can modify it as I wish. And if I want to search for a specific string in the file, then I press Ctrl W and the name, the string I'm interested to. And it says not found. Then let's look for another one. And if you press Ctrl W again and enter, it will take you to the next occurrence in the file and so on. And then it starts from the beginning. And Ctrl X to exit the file. But now we are prompted to save the modifications you have made. And if you press yes, then you are able also to change the name of the file. If you want to save the modifications you have made under another file name, you can change it here. But if you don't, just press enter and you exit the file. Now Nano is useful if you are looking for a particular line in the file. Sometimes you get an error when configuring a program that a certain line in the configuration file is invalid or syntax is wrong. And then you can access the file with nano minus C option and the name of the file. And you get, you get the line number displayed at the bottom of the file. And thus you can search for the line you're interested to. And you can also go to the next page with the page down button and page up button if the file is larger. Another thing I use is Midnight Commander or MC. And as with Nano, you will need to install the package. It, it doesn't come installed by default. And Midnight Commander, it's for browsing through the files. It's a visual file manager. And you can also use the mouse, not only the keyboard, to browse through the directories. And these two dots here means the parent directory or somehow is the equivalent of the uh, the up button in Windows. Now if you want to open a file in view mode, you press F3. So at the bottom of the window you can see that there are uh, there is the menu. And you can uh, use F3 to open the file in uh, view only mode. And you can search for a string also with the F7 key, as it says here. And it usually displays the last string you have been looking for, but you can delete it and search for whatever you want. Let's say I'm searching for log now. And if I press F7 again, it will take me to the next occurrence until it reaches the end of the file. And then you are prompted to continue from the beginning. Now, if you want to quit the file, you either press F3 or F10, and both work the same. And if you want to edit the file, press F4. And this will open up the file with the default editor. In this case, it's Nano. Now, if you want to select more files, you can use the Insert key. And once that you have selected some files, you can then go to the menu by pressing F2. And for instance, let's assume you want to archive those files. 
you have this option here to gzip or gunzip the tagged files. So all the selected files can be archived in a separate archive or unarchived if they are already archived. As they are in this case the aptitude one gzip and the other two. This one gz gz. This, these are going to be unarchived in case they are already archived, but all the other ones are going to be archived. And it will create a separate archive for each file. So not one archive for all the files you have selected, but a separate archive for each file you have selected. Now, if you want to send MC in the background and use the terminal, you can use Ctrl plus O. And you can type whatever you want in the terminal. But one thing that is specially with MC is that it has a history on its own. So if I press here something, whatever, and then I press history, it will display all the commands run when MC was running also in the background. Now that I um, quit MC and run again history, now I have another history that doesn't contain the commands run when he, MC was running in the background. Sometimes I'm looking for a command in the history and I don't find it and I'm sure that I have run it just a few moments ago. And then I realized I have run it by uh, I have running it by having MC in the background. So then I should look for that command in the history when MC is running. So I just open up MC again, Control O to send it in the background, and then I look through the history for the command I'm interested in. So MC has a history on its own. So you should keep this in mind for future use. Now the history command, it's used to display all the commands you have entered, but not the output they produced, only the commands. If you want to <coughs> look for a specific command in the history, use history, pipe, grep, and the command. Let's say log rotate. or grab ls off and it will display all the commands that contain that string another useful trick i use is reverse search but let me clear up the screen so it, you can see better so Control r it's the reverse search so if you're looking for a command from the history to reuse it, you can search for it with the reverse search tool. Let's say you want to run for, you are searching a command that contains log rotate. Then it displays you the last command. It contains log rotate. And if you press Ctrl R again, it takes you to the previous one if exists. But let's look for another one that is more frequent run and press Ctrl R and it takes you to the previous one and previous one. And if you have found the command you want to run again, you just press enter and run it. But if you don't, you just press Ctrl plus C, Ctrl C to break the reverse search tool. Also, if you know that you have run a command just recently, you can use the upper arrow to browse through the history. But this is only useful if you know that the command you have entered, you have just entered a few commands previously. Otherwise, it's not worth using it. Now, for example, if you miscenter the password in the prompt, then you want to make sure it doesn't stay in the history so that others can read it. You can delete a particular line in the history with minus D option. So let's assume you want to delete this line, ls off minus u Carmen. 
I want to delete this line and I can do this by running history minus D from delete and the line number 506. And now if I run history again, you see that that line 506 is not the same anymore. Also, you can enter commands without having them saved in the history from the beginning. You can enter a command with a space before it. And let's say that I'm running just an arbitrary word. And if I run history, you'll see that that line is not there. And why is that? Because I have set history to ignore all the commands that has a space before them. And you can also perform that by setting hist control ignore space. And if you did this, then you can run commands with a space before them and they are not going to be saved in the history. So these are a few tricks and tips I use when dealing with Linux commands and I hope you will also find them useful.